Uh, tonight's talk is titled Buddhist, um, what is it, Buddhist Outlook, uh, Buddhist Values. Uh, and uh, the uh, idea behind this is that our outlook, how we, uh, please come in here, yeah. <laughs> how we relate to the world, how we look at the world, how we look at people around us, how we relate to pretty much everything uh, actually has a massive impact on how we live our life. Uh, yeah, once you have an outlook, then your values tend to fall into place uh, in accordance with that outlook. Uh, and once you have certain values, uh, that is what informs you how you live your life. What are your priorities? Uh, what is important to you? What actually matters? Uh, it all starts with outlook. Uh, outlook, values, and then your priorities all comes from that. Uh, and just to show you very simply what I mean by this, it's a very simple kind of uh, similarly for how this works is imagine yourself if you have uh, you know people there are people in your life some people you consider friends some people you consider as enemies do you, anyone of you have enemies or are you all just friends everywhere <laughs> so but my point is not so much whether you have friends or enemies. my point is just that if you look at a person as a friend or if you look at a person as an enemy that is what i mean by different outlook is a particular way of viewing a person yeah, it's not that saying that our friend is right or that an enemy is wrong or whatever. I'm not really saying anything about that. I'm just saying this is a different outlook. And of course, once you have that outlook, there is a value. You value that person in a certain way. If they are a friend, yeah, you value them highly. If you consider them an enemy, you don't really want to have too, too much to do with them. Yeah, so this is kind of what I mean by your outlook uh, then relates directly to your values. Uh, and once you have those values, then that actually directs your life. Uh, you hang out with your friend, you kind of avoid your enemy. Uh, yeah, uh, or if you are wise, maybe you change your attitude a little bit. Yeah, that's another, another way of doing things. Uh, that's obviously the right way of dealing with these things. Uh, but your entire life is then guided by these values. Uh, what you prioritize uh, and what is important to you actually comes from that. Uh, so uh, uh, the idea of to understand what outlook, how important it actually is on the Buddhist path, uh, it is very useful to tie it in with some of the Buddhist teachings. Uh, yeah, I always like to tie things in, of course, to the Buddhist teachings. Uh, and of course, one of the fundamental of the Buddhist teachings is the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, yeah, Noble Eightfold Path, what does it start out with? Uh, right view, uh, which is very similar to right outlook. Uh, Yes, it starts with the right outlook. That's the very beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path. One of the significant things to understand about the Noble Eightfold Path is that it's not just eight factors kind of randomly put together. Yeah, the Buddha doesn't work in random ways. Yeah? The Buddha is kind of systematic. Everything is kind of organized according to sequences, according to causes and conditions and effects that come from those causes and conditions. Everything is very systematic. So when you hear like the five khandhas, don't just think that five khandhas is a random sequence of five aspects of personality. These have a particular sequence and that sequence matters. Yeah, you see the five hindrances, you think, yeah, okay, there's five bad things uh, for meditation practice. Uh, and of course, there are five bad things for meditation practice. Uh, but again, there is a particular sequence in those five hindrances. Uh, it is not random. It starts off with uh, sensual desire for a particular reason. Uh, it ends up with doubt for a particular reason. Uh, these things are not random. So everything in the Buddha's teachings hangs together. There's a system to it. Uh, and that's why when you see the five hindrances, they always come in the same sequence. Yeah, if you read them in the Pali, if you read them in Sanskrit, or read them in Chinese or Tibetan or whatever ancient language you can find, it's always the same across the board. So the Noble Eightfold Path always starts with right view, yeah, right outlook, always at the beginning. Yeah? And that matters enormously because actually what it does, it shows you that this is the foundation on which the entire Noble Eightfold Path is practiced. Yeah, it is based on right view. From right view, what happens from right view? Right outlook, you get right intention. Yeah, that is in a sense right values. You have the value of loving kindness. You have the value of uh, uh, compassion, karuna. You have the value of, of uh, uh, letting go or of giving up things. Yeah, the um, nekama, which is giving up of sensual desires. Uh, all of that actually comes, so outlook leads to values, and that then gives direction to your life. The direction to the life is in the rest of the Noble Eightfold Path, the remaining six factors, which show you how you're supposed to live your life. 
Yeah, so the foundation there is actually what makes the Noble Eightfold Path possible. Uh, without the foundation of right view, uh, the Noble Eightfold Path doesn't really even start. Uh, yeah, so make sure you get some right outlook at the beginning here. Another way of looking at uh, right, the idea of right outlook is to look at dependent origination. I'm going to be talking about dependent origination on the retreat that is coming up. Uh, are you coming on the retreat leaving here? Yes? Yeah? Okay, good. If you're not coming on the retreat, you're missing out on dependent origination, right? Uh, well, that is pretty, pretty sad, isn't it, when you think about it? Uh, so we're going to talk about dependent origination, not in a kind of theoretical way. We're going to kind of you know, look at it from the Abhidhamma point of view or anything like that. Uh, but I'm going to look at dependent origination from a practical point of view. Uh, all the teachings of the Buddha are ultimately practical. They have one purpose, uh, to move us away from suffering and to move us towards happiness. Uh, that is always the purpose of the Buddha's teachings. So it is for dependent origination. Uh, and you know, dependent origination starts off with avijja. Uh, Avijja sometimes translated into English as ignorance, uh, which I don't like. Yeah, I must admit I don't really like ignorance. Ignorance means that you haven't you haven't gone to universities, you don't know know about kind of law or or, or medicine or something. That's what ignorance is really means in English. Uh, but uh, avijja actually has more to do with delusion, uh, the fact that you don't see things according to reality. Uh. Yeah, so it is again, it's very similar to the idea of outlook, a lack of, lack of right outlook, lack of seeing things according to, according to reality. That is what stands at the beginning of dependent origination. You don't see things in the right way, that is when uh, this whole thing starts out. And dependent origination, for those of you who are New to the Buddhist teachings? Is anyone here new to the Buddhist teachings? Yes, okay, over there. Wow, okay. So you must be scared already. Yeah? I'm sure you are. So many strange words, yeah, Pali words, all this kind of stuff. So I apologize. I, after, at the end of the talk, I promise I will, there will be a few minutes to ask questions afterwards. So if you have any kind of serious doubts, take a pen, note paper, write it all down, and then you can ask afterwards. So uh, the... Uh, Dependent origination is 12 factors, or 12 items, if you like. One leading to the next one, one linked to the one after it. Starting off with delusion, or avidja, ending up where? With suffering. Yeah, so what dependent origination actually shows us, it shows us how suffering is ultimately the outcome of delusion. The reason why we suffer is because we are deluded. Yeah, and that is kind of the root cause, the root problem. Our outlook is wrong. We don't see things in accordance with reality. That is the essential problem that we are dealing with. And then that cascades through these 12 lengths and ends up in suffering on the other side. It's actually quite intuitive. We know that that's true. If you are deluded, you tend to suffer, yeah, because you make mistakes. It kind of makes sense. But this is actually a formal way of showing us how delusion transforms into suffering, yeah, and there's no way how to avoid that. So again, fundamental. And third way of thinking about outlook is to think about it in terms of meditation practice. Yeah, I'm sure many of you who have been around for a while, you will know about the Satipatthana Sutta. Satipatthana Sutta is uh, often regarded as the most, uh, probably the most well-known sutta about meditation practice in Buddhist teachings. Yeah, And one of the things that you may not know about, most people tend to read the Satipatthana Sutta, but Satipatthana is much more than the Satipatthana Sutta. There is a whole Satipatthana Sangyutta in the Sangyutta Nikaya, which collects about, um, how many now? 50, 60 discourses all about Satipatthana practice. And one of the things that these suttas show you is that Satipatthana is always based on two things. In other words, meditation practice is based on two fundamental things that have to be in place before you can do your meditation practice. Yeah, this is very interesting, isn't it? If you know these two things, then you know either why your meditation is not going so well, or why it is going really, really well, why it's going gangbusters. So you now you have the two, this is kind of the kind of clue, this is the foundation for meditation practice. What are these two things? And these are things that you see again and again in the suttas. And these two things, on the one hand, is sila. Yeah, sila being uh, morality, not just morality, but the way you live your life. If you live your life with kindness, with compassion, with care, and all of these kind of things, uh, that is what sila is, it's the habits of our lives. Uh, 
So this is one of the foundations that makes meditation possible. And that's always, I recommend you, if you find that if you're one of those people who's interested in meditation practice, you'd like to develop it further, you really go back to your sila. Ask yourself if there's any way you can lead your life in a better way. What can you do better here? How can you be more kind? Yeah, how can you kind of increase the quality, uh, the good qualities in your heart? And as you do that, uh, your meditation will gradually come together if you think about it in the right way. Huh? But the other aspect, which perhaps is less well known about meditation practice, one of the sources of Satipatthana practice, uh, is something called Ujjukaditi in the Pali language. Uh, so how many of you have heard about Ujjukaditi before? Huh? Let's have a look. No, I cannot even Frank. Okay, <laughs> okay. So, okay. So that that's, that shows you, yeah. That shows you that uh, actually there is a there's a need to kind of look at Ujjukaditi. I would be very surprised if I heard about Ujjukaditi. It's a pretty kind of obscure term, but Ujju in Pali means straight, yeah, and Ditti means view. So this is again very closely related to the idea of outlook. Having the right outlook is the same as having straight view. You're seeing things in accordance with reality, according to how the Buddha taught things. So this also is the foundation of meditation practice. So if your meditation isn't going all that well, go back to your view. Can your view be improved? What can you do to see things more in the right way? What, what, maybe maybe your, your view isn't strong enough or clear enough, not enough accordance, in accordance with the Buddha's teachings. So what do I mean by that, to actually have the straight view in this way? What does it, actually, what does it really refer to? And what it, one of the main things that it refers to is that you prioritize your meditation practice. Yeah, if you sit down and you kind of, you know, you start thinking about things, yeah, this is very common, everybody does this, and if you have never had any kind of stray thoughts in a meditation practice, then uh, I congratulate you for probably being an arahant, if that's the case. So. But usually most people have a little bit of thinking, yeah, some people, a lot of thinking, some people just think for hours, there's never no stop in the thinking, there's hardly a gap in there at all. Uh, so why is it that we think so much? And what are the things that we think about? Yeah, and the reason why we think so much is because those things that we think about, they are the things we tend to value in our life. Yeah, value again, outlook and value. You can see how these things are so closely related to each, to each other. So what are the things you, uh, you value in your life? Look at what you're thinking about during your meditation practice. And what you will see is that you think about your family, yeah, you think about your work, uh, you think about things, problems that you may have in li life, even beyond that. Uh, you think perhaps about pleasures in life. Yeah, oh, this, this meditation really sucks. Yeah, oh, it's terrible, so much pain everywhere. Uh, oh, I wish I could eat this and I could do that and kind of watch a movie or whatever. This is just too much. And uh, so you see in your meditation, you understand what your, uh, you, you see in your mind what are the real values in your life. Uh, what are the things that are important to you? Uh, so part of right outlook is to shift our values, uh, that we actually value the meditation much more. Uh, yeah, we prioritize the spiritual life. Uh, we understand that ultimately it is a spiritual life that really matters. This is what is going to make us happy at the end of the day. Uh, and all this other stuff, uh, actually, it doesn't have the same power to make us happy. We have to do these other things as well, uh, but we start doing them in a different way. Uh. And once you shift your priorities, uh, once you place your spiritual life higher than the rest of your ordinary life, then there's a shift happening in your meditation practice. You don't think about those other things anymore because they are secondary. Yeah, what's the point when you finally have come to the thing that really matters? You're finally doing your meditation practice. This is what is important in life. Yeah, you're not going to think about the other stuff if that's your view. You already have found the thing that really matters, so you stick with that and you don't go so much to uh, all of these other things. And this is the problem. You, know, you look around the world and you see people, you ask people, why do you meditate? And people say, oh, I meditate so I can become a better mother, a better father, a better son, a better daughter, a better worker, yeah? Or a better kind of bomber. If you're in the military, you want to have more precision guarded bombing, yeah? So you have more mindfulness, you meditate for that. That's kind of getting your priorities wrong, yeah? It's just, just slightly wrong <laughs> on the case of the last one. Uh, the priority 
should be the exact opposite. You don't actually do your meditation so you can do all of these thing, other things better. You do all of these other things in such a way as to enhance your meditation practice. Yeah, so you live your life, you go to work, and you go to work with a Buddhist attitude, with a sense of kindness, with a sense of caring for your co-workers, for your clients, for whoever it is. And when you go to work, and you lead your life in a way that uh, is spiritual, uh, that is done like, from a Buddhist kind of from a, a Buddhist perspective, uh, then that is going to enhance your meditation practice. Uh, you got your priorities right. Uh, you no longer you don't have the idea that I'm meditating to uh, be a better family member. Uh, you are being a good family member so that you can meditate better afterwards. Uh, meditation is where you touch the real meaning of life. Uh, yeah, in a way you can never find outside a meditation practice. Uh, so this is the idea of getting your priorities right. Outlook and values work directly into your meditation practice in this way. So uh, that is uh, uh, how these things work. So what kind of uh, things? Do, what kind of things do we mean when we talk about outlook? There's many different ways that the Buddha talks about outlook in the suttas. And one of the ways he talks about it, he talks about the vijjas, yeah, with avijja and vijja. Avijja meaning delusion, vijja being the exact opposite, meaning things like insight, essentially. I like to translate vijja as insight. The usual way, the usual word that is translated as insight in Buddhism is vipassana. And I don't really think that is quite correct, to be honest with you. I think vipassana means something like clear seeing. Yeah, insight, real insight is like wisdom. And insight, I think t the vijjas are actually a great place to start with insight. And of course, these are things like, you know, the three things like remembering your past lives, understanding the laws of karma, yeah, and then the final insight, which is the uh, arahantship, the awakening experience itself. Uh, so these are kind of the three uh, supreme insights in Buddhism. Yeah, and this is a good way of thinking about right view, in a sense, or right outlook. Yeah, you, you think, yeah, is there rebirth or is there not rebirth? That is kind of a right, right outlook. Yeah. But be careful about this, because for many people, you ask them, you know, have you got right view or not? And it's like a yes or no answer. Yes, I believe in rebirth. No, I don't believe. Okay, I believe. Okay, I've got right view. You know, first factor of the noble level path has been put into place. Now I can move on to the second one. Yes? No? Maybe? Maybe not. Yeah? Maybe it's not, that, it's not that simple. Because right view is not a static thing that either you got it or you haven't. Yes, I believe in rebirth, therefore I have right view. I don't believe in rebirth, therefore I have wrong view. It's not as simple as that. The idea of view in Buddhism, or outlook in Buddhism, or values in Buddhism, is something that you gradually develop. It is something that comes over time. Yeah? It's like an outlook that matures over time, and you need to reflect on it again and again and again. And as you do that, these things become powerful. What does it mean that there is a rebirth? Not only that you believe it, but what does it actually mean? Does the idea of rebirth, does it touch you emotionally? Do you, does it make you feel anything in particular? If it doesn't touch you emotionally, it's not going to have much power on the Buddhist path. If it touches you emotionally and you feel a sense of urgency, you feel like, wow, this is actually really important. It may be even make you feel joyful in the practice of the Buddhist teachings. Yeah? If it does that, then it becomes very powerful. So it's not a yes and no thing. In Christianity, you know, you have the idea of the Christian creed, you believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, or whatever. So there it's kind of black and white, either you believe or not. Or maybe even there, maybe I don't actually know much about Christianity, so I should be very careful what I say. But it's not, it's not like that, yeah? You either believe or you don't believe. In Buddhism, belief, view, outlook, values is something that you develop over time and it changes over time. And this is what uh, happens also with the idea of rebirth and karma until it becomes a powerful force in your spiritual life and in your meditation practice in particular. That is when it becomes very useful. But I, for most people, it is a little bit theoretical. Yeah, rebirth, okay, we can relate to it. Okay, maybe you believe it or not, but it's, not, it's kind of hard sometimes to really uh, kind of get tangible with rebirth. You can't really feel it properly. Often it is quite hard. 
but the reality is that rebirth, once you understand it, is that it is incredibly powerful. Uh, and just to give you some idea of how powerful it is, uh, this is how the Buddha talks about rebirth or the insight into past life in the suttas. Uh, you know, please remind me, if I don't say sutta as often enough, it's because I'm not teaching correctly. So please remind me, if I haven't said sutta in the next five minutes, uh, raise your hand and say, okay, sutta is please. Sutta means discourse of the Buddha. Yeah, I like to always refer back to the Buddha. And the Buddha had some very powerful similes uh, for uh, the idea of the insight into past lives and the insight into karma and also into awakening experience itself. Uh, and the first thing the Buddha says, it's like someone turning on the light. You are in darkness, yeah? And you know what it's like to be in the darkness? You're walking around trying to feel your way, and then oh, you hit your head here, yeah? And you can't really find the path. You're supposed to go to the toilet, and usually if you want to go to the toilet, it's pretty desperate, yeah? But you can't find your way. Ah! You know, you know how, what that can be like if you can't find your way to the toilet? It's a very, very bad situation. So, uh, this is... Darkness, darkness is bad. Darkness makes you blind. Darkness, you cannot see what you're supposed to do. So the Buddha says, seeing things like rebirth is like turning on the light. Suddenly, you don't bump your head anymore. You don't stub your toes into kind of little you know, things on the ground. You can find the toilet or you can find even the noble eightfold path because the light has been turned on. And most of us, we are walking around in darkness until one day we have these insights. We see them for the first time. Bang! Wow! This is what it's like. Yeah? And that is only one of the similes. Yeah? There is another one which is even more powerful. Yeah? This is the simile of the little chick, a chick in its egg. Yeah? Uh, I, I love this simile. I think it's so, it's so powerful and it really gives an idea of what insight really is about and how powerful it actually is. Yeah? So imagine yourself for just for a minute, yeah? or not even, maybe just 20 seconds. Yeah? Imagine yourself being a chick inside an eggshell. Huh? What is it like? It's pretty, you don't see very much. Yeah? The, the world is very limited in scope inside an egg. Yeah, you can see the eggshell there, eggshell here, eggshell there, and that's about it. You can't see very, maybe you can see some light coming through the eggshell if there's bright sun outside. Huh? World is very, very limited. Huh? And one day, you kind of, your claws have grown out, your beak has become strong, and you decide, this is not good enough, I want to get out of this eggshell. So you start clawing the, you know, the egg, yeah? you start kind of using your little beak to break out, and then eventually you break out of the eggshell, and you see the world for the first time. Whoa! Imagine coming out of the eggshell and seeing the world for the first time. Whoa! This is what it's like. Yeah? Jeepers! So many interesting things in this world, yeah? Wow. That's, that's, <laughs> and this is what insight is like. It's like moving, like being, going from being inside the eggshell to coming out and seeing the world in all its colors, in all its shapes, in all the perceptions, in all the various things you can see in the world. The difference is massive. This is how the Buddha explains the insight into things like past lives, into the laws of karma, into the awakening experience itself. And so these things are powerful, they are very important, and that gives you some idea of the potential change that actually can occur as your outlook moves from being in the darkness to actually seeing things correctly for the first time. So that is, uh, but still, I th the problem I think with past lives with uh, come and all these things, it often tends to be a little bit theoretical. Uh, so there are other ways of thinking about outlook. Uh, another way, of course, is the Four Noble Truths. Uh, this is what you see in the suttas again and again, right view being equated to seeing the Four Noble Truths. Uh, yeah? And uh, that, of course, is very interesting. I'm not going to talk about the Four Noble Truths uh, uh, tonight. Uh, uh, but the First Noble Truth is all about suffering. Uh, and when we talk about suffering, then of course, and that is one of the three characteristics of existence, dukkha. Now the characteristics of existence, they always come together as three. Three characteristics of existence, impermanence, suffering, and non-self. And these are very closely related to each other, because where there is impermanence, where there is anicca, where there is this unreliability in the world, suffering comes just behind. There's a very close connection between the two. 
And where there is impermanence, unreliability and suffering, uh, non-self also is very closely related to that. Uh. So these three characteristics of existence, uh, these are characteristics of the world. Uh, this is how the world actually is. Uh. This is one way of thinking about outlook. Uh. Are you able to see the world in this way? To see it in terms of anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, uh, suffering uh, and non-self. Uh. And the more you're able to see the world in that way, uh, the more ability, uh, the more the correct is your outlook from the perspective of the Buddha, from the perspective of the early suttas. You're seeing reality as it actually is. Uh, yeah? So this is why this is so important. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the you know one of the things that is always kind of you know interesting about this, I th you know these things like the three characteristics, uh, they are a way of looking at the world. And once you start looking at the world in this way, they become a kind of a refuge for you. Huh? Yeah, the more you see the world in this way, the more you accept that, the more you are able to uh, kind of live your life in accordance with that. Uh, it becomes a refuge for you. Huh? Why is that? I don't know, you know, sometimes I read newspapers, sometimes I wish I hadn't read the newspaper, you know, you, you go online and you see, you see all these stories and things, uh, but uh, you, you really look at the world today and sometimes people despair a little bit, yeah, the world, oh, it's kind of, you know, the politics are going funny, the kind of the powers of the world are doing strange things, the climate is kind of going to the dogs, actually poor dogs, I shouldn't involve the dogs in this, but anyway, it's kind of going the wrong way. You have all these refugees everywhere, you have all of these things going on in the world. It doesn't kind of look very nice. Yeah? And uh, uh, for this reason, when you see these things happening in the world, uh, actually we shouldn't really be very surprised. Because uh, this is Anicca 101. Yeah, but we all need Anicca 101 occasionally, huh? because we need to go back to the basics again. Huh? Anicca Impermanence 101, the basic fact about the world, it is always changing, it is always impermanent, it is always unreliable. Huh? So just by contemplating impermanence in your life, uh, contemplating it regularly, reminding you what it actually is, uh, when you see all these things happening in the world, you should say, okay, what do I expect? Of course these things are happening in the world. Okay, let's see what we can do about it. For sure, I don't mean that we shouldn't do anything about it. I just mean we shouldn't be too concerned about it. We shouldn't be kind of allow ourselves to get depressed about these things. Because this actually is the nature of reality. When you take these things on board and you accept these things, actually it becomes less of a shock when the world goes wrong. We have this idea that the world should go in a certain way, and when it doesn't go in a certain way, then we get upset. But the world shouldn't go in any certain way. That's kind of the, that's, that's the delusion, yeah? It's like an illusion of a self, as if something should be permanent, should always be the way it is. No, it isn't like that. The more you take that on board, the more you are able to deal with the problems, the vicissitudes, all the things in the world that go wrong. Because you know this is what to be expected. And you start to seek for refuge somewhere else. You start to seek for happiness, for a sense of meaning, a purpose somewhere else, rather than seeking it in all these external phenomena that are, by definition, by from your own personal experience, are impermanent, unreliable, not really to be trusted at all. So this is one of the first things about the idea of Anicca. And you will have noticed when I talked about Anicca right now, I'm talking about impermanence in the outside world, yeah, the world around us. And this, I think, is an important point because uh, very often, for those of you who have been Buddhist for a long time, maybe you have been sitting, coming to many retreats and all these kind of things, uh, very often we talk about impermanence, uh, anicca, unreliability, as something we see in our meditation practice. Uh, yeah, you sit down, you see things kind of rising and falling, actually not arising and passing away is much better translation of those words. These are, words are uh, Uddayavaya. Uddayavaya literally means to arise, not just kind of rising and falling, but arising from nothing, passing away into nothing. Yeah. That's what these words actually mean. Uh, ending, arising and ending. Yeah. So, uh, the idea uh, is often with Buddhist meditation is to focus on this, yeah, to see things arising and falling, and that, then getting an insight into meditation as a consequence. Uh, but when you read the suttas, uh, ha, I said sutta again, <laughs> when you read the suttas, the word of the Buddha, yeah, he, uh, 
Uh, you forgot to remind me, by the way, because I think it's more than five minutes as I said it. <laughs> when you read the word of the Buddha, he doesn't talk so much about impermanence in that way, in the idea of looking into your mind, seeing things coming and going, and all these kind of things. Uh, the way he very often talks about impermanence is big picture impermanence, macro impermanence. Uh, he talks about in impermanence in the sense that we're all going to die here. Uh, he talks about impermanence in the sense that all the things that are beloved and pleasing to us must become otherwise. He talks about impermanence in the sense that the world eventually will burn up. Yeah, he talks about impermanence in the sense of the cosmos kind of expanding and contracting and these kind of things. It is very much big picture impermanence and not the kind of micro impermanence that you see perhaps in your meditation practice. And because this is such an important part of the Buddha's teachings, uh, and because it is very easy to relate to, we can all relate to death, yeah. We may not like to think about death, but it is a reality. Any serious uh, spiritual practice uh, is about death in part. Uh, if you can't think about death, then you're not really taking your spiritual practice all that seriously. Uh, so I would recommend you, if you find it scary to think about death, just move towards very slowly. Uh, but it's a very important reminder to kind of clarify for us what really matters in life, what is important and what is not. Uh, so this is how the Buddha looks, uh, looks on uh, the idea of impermanence. Big scale, large scale impermanence, how it affects our lives in a big way. And because it is easy to relate to her, I would recommend you also to think about impermanence in this particular way. Yeah? And as you do that, it actually has a very real impact in your life. The micro scale impermanence that you see in your meditation practice only really becomes powerful once your meditation becomes quite deep. Just sitting there watching things arising and falling and all this kind of stuff often doesn't have that much, much effect on your lives. Yeah? Why? Because it isn't deep enough. It doesn't really touch you in a deep way. Yeah? Once the meditation becomes deep, that is where it really starts to take off and it has an effect in your life. One of the reasons why we focus so much on the micro-scale impermanence in our lives is largely because I think of the Satipatthana Sutta. Yeah, for those of you who know your Satipatthana Sutta, it says in there that you do all of these various things. You watch the breath, you watch the four elements, the feelings, the mind states, all this kind of stuff. And you watch them in the arising and in the passing away. And this has had a tremendous influence in the world through all the famous meditation methods that come out of different countries, come from various masters, yes? Uh, and this has had a tremendous influence on how we tend to look at impermanence, anicca. But one of the very interesting things about the Satipatthana Sutta, and this has been shown by some of the best scholars in the Buddhist world, is that actually the Satipatthana Sutta is very likely to be a compilation of many things. That have kind of uh, all this accretion of, of things that have come added to it over time. The original Satipatthana Sutta was probably far simpler than the one we have today. How do we know this? Well, we know this because there are many versions of the Satipatthana Sutta existing in different languages. Yeah? And then when you compare them, you actually realize that there is large variations in these things. And I think from reading about um, what these uh, well-known scholars have to say about this, uh, it seems to me fairly likely that that little uh, refrain about watching the arising and passing away of phenomena in Satipatthana actually looks like it does not actually come from the Buddha himself. It seems to be a later addition to that sutta. I'm not saying it is wrong. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing this. I'm, saying, I'm just saying that it may not have been originally part of the Satipatthana Sutta. And that takes a little bit of, if you like, the wind out of the sails of this kind of idea of watching the arising and passing away in your meditation practice. The way the Buddha talks about meditation, the way the Buddha talks about uh, seeing anicca is actually quite different. The way he talks about it, you have to go to places like the Anapana Sati Sutta, the discourse on uh, on mindfulness of breathing, yeah? And what he says there is that you take the mindfulness of breathing as deep as you possibly can, uh, ideally to include deep samadhi, jhanas, and all of this, then you look at impermanence afterwards. That's when it becomes very profound. 
I'm not going to go there tonight because it gets too far, but this is to give you some idea of how this actually works. So big scale impermanence is what the Buddha is talking about. Yeah? The impermanence of the world around us. No, no need to look so much inside, but look at the world around you. Huh? And once you start to look at the world around you, what you see is actually how unreliable everything tends to be. Huh? Yeah, that's what I was talking about before, the politics, the climate, the refugees everywhere, but also in your personal life. What about in our relationships, yeah, in our work, in kind of, in uh, uh, even the Buddhist teachings. Yeah, you come here, you're probably all Buddhists, or maybe you, at least you are interested in Buddhism if you are here. And sometimes, you know, you become a Buddhist and then you kind of attach a little bit to Buddhist teachings. Is that good to attach to Buddhist teachings? <laughs> okay, different opinions, different opinions, okay. Yeah, it's, it, you have to attach a little bit, yeah? If you don't attach at all, you stop coming here. So a little bit of attachment is good. Uh, but once you attach a little bit, you also see that, uh, you know, there's a danger there. The downside is you feel, oh, maybe Buddhism is disappearing here. Maybe Buddhism is going down the drain, yeah? It's becoming worse and worse. Are there any arahants left in the world? Are there maybe no arahants left in the world? What, what are we going to do? We're going to wait for Maitreya? Unsure, yeah, what's going to happen? And you start to have concern as soon as you attach to something, even when you attach to the Buddhist teachings, which I think is good, at least a little bit is good, yeah? yeah. Not kind of, if you don't attach at all, you stop being the president of the BSV, then that would be really bad. <laughs> So, uh, but you can see the danger there. Straight away, there is a danger that you actually feel, oh no, it's all going to disappear, which of course it is eventually. That is the truth of things. So, uh, uh, this is the problem of the world outside us. You see the danger in attachment. Uh, and the way I like to look at it, uh, I like to look at it as if you are, you know, you're standing on the ground. Uh, yeah, you're taking your stand somewhere. Okay, I'm going to stand here. This is like a safe piece of ground. Uh, and as you're standing there, so you're standing on the carpet, say this carpet here, this is kind of a loose carpet. Uh, and as soon as you stand on that carpet, it, uh, Shane comes, he grabs one end, uh, and he pulls the end out. Oop, and I stumble because he, Shane grabbed. Uh, Shane would never do that, of course. Uh, and this is, just a, this is just kind of a simile here. Uh, yeah? And somebody comes straight away, and they kind of pull the carpet from under your feet. Uh, and as you do that, you stumble, you fall over, and you hurt yourself. Uh, as soon as you take your stand somewhere, uh, taking a stand is like relying on something. Yeah, You rely on this piece of carpet. Uh, it looks pretty reliable, but actually, if Shane grabs that end, it's not so reliable anymore. Uh, it loses its reliability. And this is uh, the nature of all phenomena in the world around us. They are unreliable. As soon as you take your stand, as soon as you attach, yeah, as soon as you rely on something, nature, not shame, but nature comes and pulls out the carpet from under your feet and says, ha, you're going to suffer. You fall over. Yeah, actually, nature doesn't say that. Nature is kind of neutral, but that's kind of the effect of what's going on. That's how, how it works. It's almost like the world is almost perpetually shaking a little bit, yeah? And then the shaking becomes greater and it becomes smaller. And the shaking is like impermanence. Uh, and then the shaking becomes really big sometimes in our lives, impermanence becomes larger. And then, of course, we fall over because the earthquake is just so we can't stand up anymore. Uh, or maybe we fall into one of those cracks, yeah? Uh, whoa, that'd be scary here. Uh. So this is, uh, this is really what it's about. That is impermanence for you. Uh, as soon as you take a stand, uh, as soon as you attach a little bit, uh, you're opening yourself up for suffering as a consequence. Uh, so remember that. This is how the world works. Uh. And there's one uh, very beautiful simile, and this simile I teach it on every retreat I go to. And I promise you, if you come on many of my retreats, you will be hearing it again in the future as well. So if you... <laughs> and I do this because these similes of the Buddha are so beautiful and so profound and so meaningful. And every time you hear it, uh, at least for me it does that, it has an effect every time I hear it. So please don't think, oh no, we're going to talk about the same old simile. Please don't think like that. Uh, have this Zen mind, beginner mind, yeah, where you actually listen to things afresh every time. That is really the right attitude. And this simile is a simile for basically for the sensual world. Now, the sensual world is the world around us. Yeah, sensuality is not just about our cravings and desires. Sensuality has to do with the objects of the sensual world. And these objects of the sensual world are 
inherently unreliable. And this is how the Buddha makes this beautiful simile to make this point. And he says that just as if a man or a woman or whatever, someone, yeah, they borrow goods. And in those days, borrowing goods meant he borrowed a carriage yeah, and some jewelry. Yeah, that was kind of what they borrowed, I guess, in those days. Yeah, so he had a carriage and a jewelry, and then he paraded around town in his carriage wearing all this fancy jewelry, gold or diamonds or whatever it was. They had that in those days as well. Nothing has changed in terms of gold and diamonds. It's always been very popular. Yeah. So he parades around town, but he has borrowed this stuff. Yeah? And as he parades around town, people say, wow, look at this person. They are wealthy. This is how the rich enjoy their wealth. Yeah, and once somebody kind of says, yeah, look at this person, he's rich, yeah, you start to take a bit of pride in that, yeah, I'm wealthy, yeah, I'm important because I'm wealthy. This is what happens when you're wealthy, you start to think you're important. Of course, that's a delusion, but still, that's how you often think, because people start to kind of, you know, suck up to you a little bit if you're wealthy, you know what it's like, yeah? and then uh, kind of you start to feel more important as a consequence. And then, of course, because all of that wealth has been borrowed, then those people who actually own those things, they come and take it away. Yeah, the car is taken away, all that nice jewelry is taken away. And how do you feel if you have attached to that? If you ha have identified with those things, if you now identify as a rich man, but it's taken away from you, or a rich woman for that matter, and it's taken away from you, suddenly you feel naked. Yeah, it's like something has been ripped away from your personality. You have attached to that and you suffer as a consequence. So this is the Buddha's simile of the borrowed goods. And the power of the simile of the borrowed goods is that everything in our life, not everything, but a large part of the things in our life are borrowed goods. Yeah, and... Uh, if you think about it, so many of the things in our life, they, we have them now, but suddenly they disappear. Things, especially things like the material things that we have in our world. Uh, yeah? Suddenly you kind of lose money on the stock market or a thief breaks into your house or a bushfire burns down your house. Uh, a couple of years ago we had a whole town close to our Bodhinada Monastery in Perth. The whole town burned down. It was a tiny little town, but the whole town was burned down. Uh, nobody died because they were able to evacuate. Uh, yeah? And uh, so everything is so impermanent in that external world, in, the tr in, in terms of the things that we own. And of course, the real impermanence comes when we die. When you die, you can be absolutely sure that these things are going to have to go. Yeah? So what is it? It is all borrowed goods. We have it for a while, and then when you pass away, you're going to have to give it up. All these things that we have in our life, all the material things, all the wealth that we have, but much more than that, the relationships that we have, the people around us, our friends and acquaintances, our family members, they also are borrowed in a sense. We have them for a while and then they're going to have to go. Yeah, our physical body, our physical body is a borrowed goods. Borrowed goods. <laughs> Yeah, is it because this too is going to have to go. When you die, it's all going to have to go. And lastly, the final thing that is also borrowed goods, actually could probably come up with much more, is actually so much of our identity, who we take ourselves to be, is also tied up with this world, tied up with this life right now. Your position in your family, whether you are male or female, what kind of education you have, your social status, all of these things also are essentially borrowed goods that are tied to this life right here and right now. And once you understand that these things are borrowed goods, you start to relate to them in a very different way. Yeah, and I'd like to uh, uh, make, uh, kind of extend the simile a little bit. So imagine that you are renting an apartment somewhere. You're renting it for two or three months. After two or three months, you're going to have to go and go somewhere else. How much of your own effort, of your own energy, of your own money, of all these things are you going to put into that apartment uh, if you know you're going to have to leave in two months? Uh, it is when we own things, when it's my house, my apartment, that's usually when we put in extra effort to make it nice and because it's mine, yeah? But that mine is a delusion. Uh, that Real, the reality is that all of these things in our life are actually like that rented apartment. We have it for a while, then it's going to have to go. 
So what this does to us, once we understand that so many of the things in our life are temporary, are there for a while, they are borrowed goods, it changes our investment strategy. Yeah, instead of investing in things that you have borrowed, instead of investing in that apartment that you're going to have only for two months, you start investing in things that you have for the long term instead. Now what is it according to the Buddhist teaching? What is the one thing that goes beyond this life? And the one thing that goes beyond this life is your mind. Yeah? You take your mind with you as you pass away. So your investment strategy changes a little bit. Instead of thinking about how I can invest in the things that belong to this world and have to remain in this world, you start, instead uh, you start to invest in things that are there for the long term. Yeah, the mind, you start thinking about the mind instead. Uh, and that becomes your new investment strategy. Uh, how do we invest in the mind? What does it mean to invest in the mind, first of all? Uh, and what it means, it means that we build up a mind that is more bright, more beautiful, more light, more happy, that has less suffering. Uh, and as we do that uh, consistently with commitment and perseverance, gradually, 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 your mind changes it from what it was like earlier on. From year to year to year, your mind actually does become lighter, more happy, more beautiful. Yeah, That is what it means to invest in your mind. How do we do that? And it's very simple. The idea of investing in things that belong to this world, that is measuring everything in terms of the successes we have in this world. Status, how much, you know, how much we have in this particular life. But uh, the alternative investment is not so much about looking at what we have, uh, how, we, how we succeed with the worldly phenomena. Rather, we look at the process that gets us to, the, to those goals. How do we live is what matters. Yeah? The goals themselves, okay, they may come, they may not come. We don't focus so much on the goals anymore. We start to focus on the process instead. How do we actually live? It actually what starts to matter in our lives. And instead of uh, just forgetting about the process and, and looking at the goals, that's what many people do, if you forget about the process and only focus on the goals, uh, often you do things that are bad, you do things that are immoral, because the goal is what matters, the process is, is insignificant, yeah? The, uh, um, the means, kind of the goal, the, the goal justifies the means, yeah? This kind of ancient principle which is really dodgy, uh, doesn't really work in Buddhism, uh, because you think like that, anything is acceptable. But if you focus instead on the actual process, on the how of getting there, and you forget about the goal for a while, then you can start to live morally. Then you can start to live with kindness. Because you understand that living with kindness, that is what really matters. It's the process that is important. And very often what you find is that if you focus on the process, and you forget about the goal, the goal kind of happens anyway. Yeah. Good people very often have good results. That is my experience anyway. I hear people sometimes say that, oh, bad people, they get good results. Well, maybe, maybe not. But anyway, it's superficial good results anyway. It doesn't really matter. But if you focus on the process, even if the goal doesn't turn out, yeah, even if you don't get to the goal that you're kind of looking for, it doesn't matter so much because you have done the process in the right way. And by doing in the process in the right way, there is another goal that you reach, and that is an inner goal. The inner goal of purifying yourself, of brightening up your mind, making yourself more happy, making your, uh, your life a more uh, light, beautiful, kind life, and you feel uh, another kind of goal which actually has much more to do with the real meaning of life. That is what is being fulfilled instead. Uh, so make sure you get your investment strategy right. Yeah? If you want to have investment advice, always come to Buddhist monks. Uh, we give the best investment advice. Uh, long term, yeah, not short term, really, really long term investment advice is what this is, what it's all about. Uh, so remember that. It's such a powerful simile. Almost everything in life is borrowed goods. Look at those things where you have a degree of control, where you have a degree... What, where do you have control? Your inner life. You can choose whether you're going to be kind. You can choose whether you're going to be generous. You can choose whether you're going to have meta-kindness, and whether you're going to have compassion, or whether you're going to be mean. Yeah, there we have some degree of choice. External things we can't really control at all. Your inner life, that is where you have a measure of control. So go for where you have a measure of control. 
then you are living the spiritual life in the right way here. So this is the Buddha's beautiful simile of the borrowed goods. And I'm soon uh, talking on borrowed times, so I've got to be careful here. <laughs> so, uh, so what does that mean? So, how do, so what, what, what else does that mean? Does it have any other consequences? And uh, one of the consequences it has for me, one of the nice things I also learned from Ajahn Brahm, is to learn to be more of a, a passenger in the world, to be more of a visitor to the world, rather than an owner in the world. Uh, the more you own things in the world, the more you are the owner of your relationships, of your house, of the things around you, uh, the more you try to control. Uh, but the more you are a visitor in the world, you've come to this planet, you're visiting here for a while, yeah, you're enjoying the sights, you're enjoying the good company of people around you, but if you are visiting somebody else's house, you don't try to control that house, you don't try to kind of sort things out, you just wander around in the house and you have a good time and you enjoy yourself. So you become more like a visitor in this life. And when you are a visitor in, in this life, you start, there's less attachment there. And then with less attachment, you're able to live that spiritual life in a far better way as a consequence. So this is how then you deal with the impermanence in a skillful way in the world. Ultimately, you have to go even beyond that. You have to go beyond even the idea of making a beautiful mind and all these things. And that is where the deep meditation comes into place, where you have real insight into all of these things. And uh, that is certainly really, really worthwhile. Uh, but it's much further down the track. Yeah? Yeah? So I'm not going to go there tonight because I think it's probably going a bit too far. Uh, but that is where things like the mindfulness of breathing and all the meditation practices uh, come into their own. Uh, when you want to see impermanence in a really deep and profound way. Uh, so, um, uh, what about, I said I was going to talk about the three characteristics, cheapest, that's only one. Uh, okay, very briefly about the two other characteristics. Uh, uh, second one is the idea of dukkha, of suffering. Uh, how can we understand the idea of suffering in a way that is useful? Uh, one of the, of course, one of the things that we have to do is just to understand the suffering of ordinary life, not to be kind of blind to the fact that there are problems in life. Sometimes you hear people say, oh yeah, I don't have any suffering in my life. And uh, of course, to me, that is just a delusion. Everybody has suffering in their life. Why? Because everybody attaches. When you attach to something, there's bound to be suffering coming along with that. It's impossible to have a life without suffering, unless again you are an arahant, you're fully enlightened. That is really the only possible case. So that's the first thing, just to be honest about what life is about. But the second thing to do is to remember that understanding suffering fully is actually part of the insight onto the Buddhist path. Yeah, so understanding suffering fully really starts when you uh, start to practice these teachings and you start to kind of uh, go deeper into your meditation practice. And one of the beautiful similes that is found in the suttas used by the Buddha is where the Buddha says there's two uh, similes of the two friends that come to a mountain here. Yeah, they come to this mountain and then one uh, friend kind of stays at the base of the mountain, the other one goes to the top. Yeah, and then the one who goes to the top, he kind of looks out. He says, wow, I can see so much from up here. And he shouts down to his friend, yeah, listen friend, I can see fields and villages and houses and forests and kind of everything from this top of this mountain. Yeah. And then this friend at the bottom of the mountain, he says, no way, I don't believe it. There's no way that you can see all that stuff from the top of the mountain. Yeah. And then this kind of friend on the top of the mountain, he gets a bit kind of exasperated. Yeah, I'm here, I can actually see it. So he goes down to the bottom, grabs him by the arm, pulls him up to the top, yeah, and says, okay, look, what do you see? Oh, yeah, he's a bit, he's a bit sheepish now. Yeah, yeah, I can see villages, fields, and all these kind of things. Yeah. And the idea of the simile, and this is the idea of how to understand suffering here, yeah, is that once you climb this mountain here, yeah, and climbing the mountain here is a simile for meditation practice, yeah? You go deeper and deeper in your meditation. It's like climbing the summit of samadhi, getting out of the world, climbing to a higher realm, if you like. And once you go to the higher realm, only then can you see the landscape underneath properly. Only then can you understand how the world actually works. So you practice your meditation practice, yeah? Until one day you are so above your ordinary life. You have the bird's eye view, the eagle's eye. You look out at the world and you see the sensual world, especially for what it actually is like. 
And when you see it for what it actually is like, because you have the view above the world, you've given up the world in a sense, then you can start to understand what suffering is about. Only when you come up to that high kind of level, that is where you start to understand these things properly. So there is a degree, there has to be a degree also of faith sometimes, or confidence if you like, in the teachings of the Buddha. And this is what this is about. When the Buddha says there is a higher happiness, there's a higher vantage point from which you can see and look at the world, and this is what is happening in this particular case, then you can start to understand these things in a deeper way. Very briefly towards the end, the idea of non-self. Yeah, this is one of the most profound aspects of the Buddhist teachings. And very often when you talk about non-self, people get scared. Yeah, what do you mean non-self? That sounds really scary. Especially if you come to the Buddhist teachings, you know, for the beginning, you think non-self is really kind of worrying and a, and a problem. After a while you get used to the idea, it's not a problem anymore. But that's also a danger, getting used to things, because then it doesn't really impact on you anymore. So how can we understand non-self in a way that it isn't so frightening? Why do we get frightened, by the way, by non-self? And the reason is because uh, uh, when we say that things are non-self, uh, it actually challenges our very existence. Uh, yeah, if, uh, if, if someone tells you that your perceptions of the world or your, your, your will, yeah, your, 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 your sense of agency doesn't really come from you, it's kind of scary, yeah, because this is, these are things that are very deeply rooted in us as our sense of identity. And that's why it is scary. So how can we avoid that scariness? And actually, it's very easy. It's, very, it's not that hard to do. Any of you who have been here for, come here for a long time and practice in Buddhism for a long time and done some meditation practice, you will know that when your mind becomes more peaceful, yeah? when there is less thinking going on in your mind, the more peaceful you are, the more happy you tend to be, the better things tend to be. And as you become very, very peaceful, you get all kinds of joy and happinesses, so many wonderful things arising inside of you. But one of the things that you notice as you become more peaceful is that your sense of self starts to diminish. Yeah, the sense of self expresses itself through your thinking mind, through all the doing, through all the activity inside of us. But as you let go of that, as the sense of self goes down, you actually feel happier and happier and happier. So once you get that, once you start to see the connection between the lack of sense of self inside and happiness, on the other hand, you start to understand that this non-self business actually it's pretty cool, yeah, it's good stuff. And then, of course, it starts to inspire you and you start to imagine how far can I go on this path of non-self? And you start to extrapolate how, where meditation is gonna take you in the future. And once you start to extrapolate, you can start to get some idea where this is heading. The less sense of self there is, the more powerful the stillness, the more powerful the happiness. This is what this magical path of Buddhism actually promises you. That suddenly non-self is not scary anymore, It's Bloom and marvelous. No, sorry. <coughs> it is really good, yeah. And this is kind of the point of this. So instead of trying to think about it, instead of trying to rationalize the idea of non-self, try instead to experience it as a felt reality. And when you do that, you actually start to see this is really good stuff. It's very beautiful. And that is how you can get a handle on the Buddhist idea of even of non-self and all the three characteristics of existence. So these are, in brief, how to think about the three characteristics within. This is the outlook, yeah? the way of looking at the world. The more you look at this in the right way, the more you understand, especially impermanence. The reason why I focus so much on impermanence was because this is perhaps the easiest one of the three characteristics to relate to. The more you understand that, the more your values change. Instead of values being worldly values, how to kind of you know, get the right status, how to get you know, the right possessions, the right relationships, all of that. Instead of that being the values, you start to look for the inner values instead. Yeah, a rich inner life, an inner life of compassion, kindness, metta, peace, all of these positive things. That is where your value starts to lie. Why? Because you know that is something which is there for the long term. How can we ensure that this happens? How can we ensure that this, we are 
uh, moving continuously towards a great, more and more, a better and better Buddhist outlook in our lives. So, so we understand impermanence better and better over time, so that it informs our values, which in turn inform our priorities in life. How can we do that? Uh, and the way to do that is to come back to the Buddha's teachings, uh, read the Buddha's word, yeah? come to Dhamma talks that actually talk about the word of the Buddha, Come back to these beautiful teachings again and again and again. And as you do so, gradually your outlook will shift. Your values will shift accordingly. And eventually also your priorities in life will also alter. It's a gradual thing, but it's a very beautiful path. And as you see this path moving, as you see, th see things changing inside of you, you're gradually moving away from suffering, moving away from problems uh, towards greater and greater satisfaction, contentment, completion, and all of these positive, positive things in life. Uh, you're moving towards uh, discovering the very meaning of life itself, uh, because this is ultimately what the Buddhist teaching is all about. Uh.